So, as we get started with this, I think I'm getting to pray first. I'm going to pray right now. So I'm going to pray first. Father God, please, please, please remove me from this equation. Help me to, uh, in a sense, abase myself, uh, to, to put myself lower, to, to get myself out of the way. Holy Spirit, may you be not just prominent, may you just be the only, the only person uh, speaking at this time. Please remove my desires, thoughts, biases, all of that stuff. Uh, Get that all out of the way. So I may speak your words, Lord, for your people and also for the people who do not know you yet. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. So I used a word in that prayer, which is not used that often anymore. And it is a word called a base, a base, A-B-A-S-E. You don't hear that word too much anymore. It actually was very popular. I was looking this up uh, today, this morning, actually. It was very popular at the end of the 18th century into the beginning of the 19th century. And then it became less and less popular as as time has gone on. It's, gone, it's gotten lower and lower and lower every year since that. So let's talk a little bit about that word. Because now that we're back on the mountain, back on a mountain with Jesus, we, we had gone a few weeks and, and talked about the sacraments. Uh, we talked about the sacrament of baptism. We talked about the sacrament of Holy Communion. And we did a couple of other things since we have a, a number of new uh, folks in in different parts of the world. Again, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone in Virginia. I'm sorry. I should have said that. Everyone in Virginia, North Carolina, and in Liberia, and also in, I was almost saying Nigeria. Might be Nigeria, too, but in Kenya. I uh, want to say hello to everyone there and everyone else uh, that is watching us either live right now or later on, on video on demand. And we also have audio as well. So since we're back on a mountain and Jesus is actually addressing something where a base is the the proper word to use. It's a good, good word. It's actually a very good word to use, but a lot of people don't know the word a base. So let me talk about a little bit of its origin derivation. So a base is from the Latin and the old French and the old French word is abbasier, and abbasier would be would be spelled a b a i s s i e r, which means to lower, which means to lower. So in English, the definition of a base means to be lower in rank, office, prestige, or esteem. To abase oneself is, again, to lower yourself in any of those areas. Now, we're in 2023. Lowering oneself, bringing oneself down so so other people can be kind of raised up, is not really one of the most popular things you hear in 2023. In the Western world, it is so much about raising yourself and making yourself the uh, pinnacle of what people should be paying attention to. So this is not something which is obviously really uh, promoted at this time, to say the least. On top of that, like I said, bringing yourself lower, the other thing that Jesus is going to be showing us in this teaching. And also he has been showing us as we have been on on this mountain is self-promotion or promoting ourselves so other people can see or hear. This is something which is private, which is intimate. We'll get into this more intimate between yourself and God. 
even if it's like a really good thing. Uh, no one's supposed to know but you and God. I know, I know. That is really going to hurt all your TikTok followers who are not going to be able to, to see and, and know all of what you're doing. And this is why, again, Jesus is very countercultural in our time and in our place. So let's get started on talking about and reading the scripture where the title of this for today is Secretly Subduing Ourselves with the Supreme. Secretly Subduing Ourselves with the Supreme. I know. So let's get started. So the scripture that we're first going to go to is Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18. So please have your Bibles up and ready. I'm going to give you some time to do that. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. And again, you can do this on our aciw.online.church where you are and just find the Bible. Just click on the Bible and then go find it that way. Or if you have your Bible up. All right, let's go. Verse 16. And this is Jesus speaking. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Praise be to God for his word. So before I really get into the specifics of of what God and what Jesus is, is talking about for this, What I do want to address is kind of give you a little background on fasting for the Old Testament, because it's very important that we understand and we know what the people who are listening to Jesus, what they're thinking, what they know of that word, because the people listening to Jesus are Jews. This is Matthew. He's speaking to Jews, to a Jewish audience. And Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience for the most part. So what what are they thinking? What what does fasting mean to them? So we're going to go over the first thing, and most important probably, is that there was one time a year where it was mandatory for all Jews to fast one time a year. And this mandatory fast from the Jewish law is the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. And so we're going to go to Leviticus. We're going to go to Leviticus chapter 16, verses 29 through 34. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 29 through 34. And it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. Verse 32. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make atonement wearing the holy linen garments. 33, he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting, and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. 
and this shall be a statute forever for you, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. Praise be to God's word. And so what is this atonement for? And as you notice, it's atonement for all sins of everybody. Well, this goes back to Genesis. This goes back to Adam and Eve sinning against God. And how, again, Adam's sin, remember, again, we've gone over this. Those of you who may have not been with a, a church in the world in a while, we've, we've covered this as ha- when Eve ate the fruit first, their eyes were not opened. Their eyes were not opened. Adam was right there listening to the serpent, and he did not step in and stop because he was given the responsibility. It was only after Adam ate that the eyes were opened, and that sin then manifested itself in not just them, but into all of us. For one man, for one man's sin infected all the rest of us. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later on. So if you go through the Genesis story and you go through all the stories, Exodus, and you see constantly everywhere, the people of Israel, the people outside of Israel, whatever, sinning in all sorts of manners. And you cannot sin before a holy God without consequences. But our God is merciful, and he had picked Israel out to be his special possession. So those sins had to be atoned for. And that's the Day of Atonement. I'm not going to go into, they sacrificed uh, different animals. They had what's called the scapegoat, where they had one goat, which was sacrificed, and the other goat, which is kind of like the sin was put out of the tent was put out of where all of the Jewish people were. It's like the sin was taken away. But then what's going to happen again? We're going to sin for another year and it has to be atoned for every year. So now you notice you don't see fasting there. There's not the word fast. It's actually affliction. You are to afflict yourself. And again, I was talking about a base is a great word on this. But it's to humble, to weaken yourself. It is the Hebrew word ana. Ana, A-N-A is our transliteration for it. So many of you, if you're definitely, if you're from the Northeast or other places, that are are familiar with it. I'm from northern New Jersey, and this was actually a school holiday, and actually is still a school holiday up where my sister teaches in South Orange, New Jersey. It is the Day of Atonement is the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. Yom being Y-O-M, with Yom, if I remember correctly, Hebrew is day, and Kippur, uh, I'm pretty sure, is atonement. So Yom Kippur. And I wanted to give you just from a Jewish perspective how they see that even today. So I actually went to the Fellowship of Israel Related Ministries. And so this is just a little excerpt of what they had on their website in discussing Yom Kippur. All right. This unique holiday is a day of complete fasting. Complete fasting. And it says, even the less observant or less religious Jews quiet down their lives for 25 hours. In Israel specifically, everything comes to a full stop. This includes, this is amazing, I did not know this, including airports and traffic. Everything stops. Time is set aside to reflect on one's life and to correct any wrongs. Yom Kippur is the time to ask God for forgiveness. 
The goal of fasting and abstaining from work is to focus solely on God and His grace. By denying one's flesh, one learns to distinguish what is most important and what is secondary in life. We see clearly the difference between truth and fraud. That's the end of that. So, this is a a time of abasement. This is a time of denying yourself. This is a time of lowering. This is a time of coming to the Lord in 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 a heart of contrition. Hopefully, we are convicted. That's a word I really like to use. That we are convicted of how f- how far we fall short of what God's standard is. It says in the New Testament, we are to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And what's a, what's a, uh, I don't want to say wonder, it's not a wonderfully famous term. What is a famous phrase that we use? I know a lot in the United States. I don't know if it's used a lot in other countries as well. Well, you know, nobody's perfect. We love to use that as an excuse to excuse our sin, to excuse us falling short of God's glory. Yom Kippur is at least a yearly reminder for the Jewish people to this day of the difference between themselves and who God is. And this is not to, in a sense, I, I, what happens is sometimes people, sometimes people beat themselves up, then they go too far in the other direction. We are still created in God's image. We are marred to a certain extent as his image bearers because of sin, because of us falling away. But this is, like I said, I like to use the word conviction, convicted to be better, to seek God more in prayer and as they were, they do on Yom Kippur and in fasting. So I do want to emphasize that that is fasting, even in the Old Testament time, so when when Jesus is talking to them back in here, first century Palestine, they understood that fasting was mandated only once a year. However, they also knew throughout the Hebrew scriptures, there were many voluntary fasts that a multitude of people did for many different reasons. But the heart posture is the same. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. So we're going to go, there are so many, 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 there were actually, I don't know, I was uh, in doing this study, I went over every single instance of fasting in the Old Testament. I'm guessing it was around, gosh, I didn't totally, I know it was over 30 and it was probably more than that uh, when going over all of them. Uh, Basically, I searched fasting for everything. And sometimes it wasn't about, quote unquote, it was the word fast, like you hold fast to something. So it's not always fasting in the sense of what we're talking about here. So I didn't want to take too many because of time, but I did want to give you a kind of a a, a variety uh, of what I did see in the Old Testament. So we have four we're going to go through. We're going to go through them slowly. So the first one is Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter twenty, verses one through four. Second Chronicles, chapter twenty, verses one through four. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Meunites came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Now, Jehoshaphat is one of the kings of Israel, okay? 
or is it in this case, it might have been Judah at this time. Jehosha Jehoshaphat was a good king. Now you have to understand most of the kings after, so let, let me go back a little bit. So the first king was Saul, started off well, and this is all of Israel, started off well, then messed up. He was replaced by David, who for the most part was a good king, is considered a very good king. But as, <laughs> as everyone knows, even the good folks have serious flaws and serious challenges. I'm not going to get into that. David had not more, <laughs> not just one, but a few serious challenges he had. But he was considered a good king. Solomon was the next king. He was the wisest human ever because God gave him that gift. So he was a good king, but he had a myriad of challenges, which we're not going to get into now. But so I just want to give you, so quote unquote, good. And then there's bad kings. Like after that, you, you've had Manasseh, you had a whole bunch of other bad kings. And actually Israel got split between the house of Judah and all the rest of the other 11 tribes. So there's 12 tribes in Israel and Judah was one tribe. And that's where Jesus, Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. Uh, you hear Jesus talked about as the lion of Judah. That's where that comes from. And then the other 11, once they were split every, there were 20, if I remember correctly, there were 20 Kings for Israel. The other 11 tribes, all 11 were bad. Different degrees of bad, but all bad. Judah had 20 kings as well. Eight were considered good. The other 12 were bad. All right. Jehoshaphat was one of the good ones. All right. So let's go back to verse two. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Eden. Edom, excuse me, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazazon Tamar, that is, in Jedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help help, help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So this was a fast in time of war, in time of war, in time of distress, where Jehoshaphat came before, sought, sought God, and not just him, it's like a whole, trying to get a hold of Judah to seek after the Lord to help protect them. So in time of war, seeking protection. This next one was interesting. I, I really, I was like, wow, okay. And I'm going to say something afterwards. So this really like hit home for me on this. So we're going to go to Ezra chapter 8, verses 21 through 23. Ezra chapter 8. Verses 21 through 23. Verse 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there, this is Ezra, at River Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. I was like, wow. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. Verse 23, so we fasted and implored our God for this. So you're fasting and Praying, asking God, beseeching, implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. This is this one hit me quite hard in a good way, 
because I know so many times my wife prays for traveling mercies. I was like, wow, this is really beseeching God, fasting even in this case, because they knew when traveling where they needed to go, they're going to be going through lands where people could be antagonistic to them. So they're praying for protection in travel. They're not at war with anybody. They're just trying to travel to get to where they needed to get to. And they sought the Lord through fasting and imploring him and entreating him to protect them. And he did. And he chose to do so. Oh, this one. Oof. Wow. This one was, I had forgotten. The, the great thing about the Bible is like you can read it so many times. And this is why it's like eternity is never going to get boring because I can see there's so much I've read and now I read it again and I've read it again and you miss stuff. And you're like, whoa, was that always there? That couldn't have always been there. There's no way that always was there. But I know it was always there. So we're going to go to Psalm 35. Verses 11 through 14. Psalm 35, verses 11 through 14. And this is really very interesting for me. Verse 11. So this is David speaking. This is David, King David speaking. 11. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. Verse 13. But I, when they were sick, so these people, I want you to get this, these people, and there's there's more verses before this talking about how these people are so injurious to David, causing him harm. But look what he does in 13. But I, when they were sick, when they were sick, he wore, look at this, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself. Again, you see this afflicting with fasting. He fasted for them. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. Again, you see one of the things you're going to see often, fasting, prayer. Prayer, fasting. He prayed and fasted for his enemies. 14, I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. Oh, talk about conviction for me. Oh, man. Not not only, again, I'm just going to speak for me. There's so many times when I do this study and I give a message. If it's not for anybody, it's definitely for me because this is like convicted me. How hard is it to pray for people who do you wrong? How hard is that just to pray? And even kind of like a fake prayer. You know what I'm saying? I know it's not just me. It It is not just me. Is that you at least get to the levels like, I know I'm supposed to pray for my enemies. All right, I hope they're okay. You know, and you're like, oh, okay, I did pray. And that your heart's not in it. You're just saying words. You're just saying words. And I'm talking about me. I'm just saying words. And so, you know, over time, I have gotten to the point where, Lord, I really do draw them to yourself. And I, I am sincere about that. I've gotten to them where like, okay, please draw them to my to themselves, please, to yourself. But have I got, have I ever gotten to the point where I'm praying so sincerely and I, I, I want them to be better so bad that I am going to fast sackcloth. I'm going to abase myself. I'm going to bring myself down that much for someone who is doing me harm. That I'm going to do it at, at, at 
at the level that he's talking about, let's read 14 again. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother as one who laments his mother. I bowed down in mourning. Oh, oh. Oh, Eva, oh gosh. I just, I don't know if it's you, but that just hits me so hard. And it's like, I'm so falling so short of that. Lord, please help me. So this is fasting, abasing yourself, bringing yourself down in such a way to seek the good for those who hurt you. Wow. I I missed that. I missed that. Well, now I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to see it other places too. Just to make me just, and again, I, I was saying in my mind, which is not the right thing to say, beat myself up more. That's not what I sh- should say. Convict me more. Oh, Lord, please transform me. Uh, please change me to have that sort of heart, which is your heart, Lord. I mean, God's heart is so much that all of the sins that we had continued to do over and over and over again, what, what did he do? He sent himself to take our sins, all of our sins. I can't even, I can't even rational. I, I can't even put it into words. I can't put it into words. What that even means. But this is David's giving us an example that is doable. And for us to say, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Well, no, you can't. But God can through you. The power of God can do it. And this is before the Holy Spirit came to live in all Christians. So last one I'm going to give as an example is Esther, which, yes, is the same Esther we did earlier today as a scripture reading, but I'm going to do a little bit more. So it's going to be Esther chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Esther chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Verse 13. Then Mordecai, now Mordecai is Esther's uncle, Esther's uncle. And he was I, an uncle who was also kind of a, I would say a guide, almost like a father to her uh, during her time. So then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. Context. Okay. What has happened? Haman, who was an official of the king at that time, had gotten the king to issue an order to have all the Jews eliminated. Okay. Because Haman hated the Jews. Now, Esther was Queen Esther now, one of the queens of the king. The king didn't know she was Jewish. Okay, That was hidden from him. So Mordecai is saying, Esther, don't think just because you're queen and no one knows you're Jewish that you, this is going to be, you're going to be able to get away and and not perish like the rest of us. Verse 14, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. I love this. I love this. So this is a teaching moment here. Many times I hear from Christians is that I need to do this for God. And that may be the case. But then they go a little bit farther. And if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. Really? Are you saying that God has to depend on you to get something he wants to get done? I know I'm not the only person who's heard that. So I, I, I'm go- I know some people, we have some people live. Have, has anyone else, Can you, you can type that in the chat. Has anyone else heard that? It's like, you know, if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. God needs me to do it. 
I still, for example, people say, I still have to be on this earth because if I don't do it, God's what God wants to get done is not going to happen. Now, let's not get it twisted. There is times when God is communicating to us that he is calling us to do something. And we should do it. And he does want to work through us to get it accomplished. But if it is something he wants to get accomplished, it's going to get accomplished whether you choose to do it or not. And I love that Mordecai communicates this, saying relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Meaning, he's saying, hey, you, God put you in this position of authority and influence for a reason. Verse 15, then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Verse 16, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. Eat or drink is what's called an absolute fast. There are absolute fasts where you don't eat or drink. There are partial fasts where you don't eat eat, but you can drink water and stuff. That's, again, when you're looking uh, in the commentaries and the concordances and the biblical stuff going through the words and etymology of words uh, in the Hebrew, that they talk about the absolute and the partial fasts. So this is an absolute fast. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king though it is against the law. Now, context again. You are not supposed to go speak to the king unless he summons you. It is against the law. If you go speak to the king without the permission to come speak to the king, it's actually can be a death sentence. That's how the law in that land worked. So she said, then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So this is an emergency situation. This is, for example, for the nation of Israel, it was a national emergency. Where they sought the Lord. With prayer, with fasting, with fasting. And actually fasting and then an action being done by a particular person. So I wanted, and there's, there's so, so, so many more, but I want you to understand those people listening to Jesus on the mountain would understand these, would understand that, yes, we fast the day of atonement, we fast, pray once a year for the sins that we have committed, all of us have. But we also know that we fast and sometimes we pray and and many times we pray and fast in different situations coming to the Lord for help in a myriad and multitude of situations that come up in our lives. So, Understanding that context. So what is Jesus trying to communicate to his listeners here? What is he trying to communicate? Well, you know, it's important for me at this time to actually go backwards a little bit. We're going to rewind and go up actually to the first verse in in Matthew 6. First verse in Matthew 6. So Matthew 6, verse 1. Matthew 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. 
you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And we're going to talk about rewards a little bit later, but I'm holding off on that. Holding off on that. You have to be with us in the next few weeks. But I want you to see, he said for this whole section, and what is this section? What am I talking about? Well, this whole section is divided into three parts. Discussing central elements of the Jewish religion. Number one, which is in verses two through four, is how Jesus is telling them, telling the people there how you should give alms. And alms is giving to the poor. It's like we should give to the poor, but he talks about how we should give. And we did again, we did sermons earlier talking about how people gave. And we'll talk about it in a moment. Number two, verses five through eight, is how we should pray. How we should pray. Then he gives a model prayer, but first it goes how we should pray. And finally now, in verses 16 through 18, how we should fast. So the the question which we saw earlier with giving to the poor and praying Yes, we're supposed to give to the poor. Yes, we are supposed to pray. But what is our heart posture? Are we doing it for ourselves? So people can see how great we are? Getting man's approval, man's praise? Are we doing it because we love God and God alone? As we saw earlier, when talking about giving to the poor, it's like, uh, Jesus said, uh, similar to the trumpet blowing, if you look up, if you again, if you want to look through Matthew 6 and go through that, trumpet blowing to say, hey, I'm giving, making sure everybody knows totally that I'm giving to the poor. I'm, I'm such a great person. Or as he says, proclaiming on the street corners, I'm praying. I'm praying. You guys see, I'm so holy. Jesus is addressing the issue, which is a little different. It's still like blowing a trumpet. It's still like telling everybody on a street corner. But with fasting, people did it a different way. And I know this because, again, this is, again, conviction, 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 conviction. Uh, we're going to go back to Matt with uh, Matthew 6, 16 through 18. I'm going to read it again. And again, oh, gosh, this is so painful. It's just so painful. Just again, oh, This is so me. All right, verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Now, you heard me talk about what fasting. Fasting was one of the hardest things for me to do because I really enjoy eating. I really love food. Really do. And my wife can cook, cook, cook. Oh, she's such a great cook. And... When you go, I went through every, like I said, I went through every single fasting reference in the Old Testament. And every reference is about fasting at the very least from food. Every reference is about fasting from food at the very least. A partial fast. Everyone. Every single one. And so once I got to the point, it's like, okay. I see there's sometimes I I should be fasting, okay? And again, it's it's voluntary. Please hear me. It's voluntary. But when I fasted, I was like, uh, you know, I didn't, this might've been, I had some hair back in time. You know how you want to make people know that you're doing something for them and you're like, it's, you're you're suffering for it. So it's like, oh, you, you walk into work and you're walking slowly, you know, you're, it, it, like your eye might you like do a fake twitch on your eye and people go, Oh, w- what's wrong? 
What's wrong? And then you get the opportunity to say, well, to show how holy I am, I'm fasting. And so people can go, oh, oh, you're so holy, Kyle. You're so holy. I'd like to be like you one day. <laughs> I hate that guy. I'm like, uh, I, you know, I kind of like, yeah, if I'm fasting, I want people to know. This is what was being done back then, too. And we know in other situations, people want to other people to know that they're sacrificing for them or they're sacrificing for something. But let's just stick to this text. I'm not going to go beyond the text. What Jesus is saying, and we go to 17, because again, here we go, before 17 and, and the 16, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. So my reward is you're, you're getting nothing from God. You do that sort of stuff. Your reward is what those people gave you, whatever those people gave you. You forfeited the reward from the king of the universe and chose the reward from people who might, the best you might get. It's like, oh, wow, you're, wow, I wish I could be like you. As opposed to others like, oh, gosh, I hate those Christians trying to show, right, that you might get that part of the reward. It's just so dumb on my part. I, I ugh, Conviction, conviction. So 17 says, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Verse 18, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret. Again, there goes my TikTok post. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Oh, it's so much about heavenly rewards. We're going to get there. Not this week, but we're going to get there. <sighs> Have you been like me, like verse 16 at all? Have you been like that? I hope not. And if you have, there's still hope for us. Because Jesus is just committed. Don't do that. Don't do that. So now going forward, when when I do fast, and make sure I put my cologne on, make sure I shave, make sure the beard's trimmed properly, make sure my hair hasn't gone, you know, I don't have much hair anymore, but if I do let it grow, I end up like having a little like volcano in the middle of my hair, so it looks a little weird if I do that. No, no, make sure. Don't wear tattered clothes, just wear your regular clothes, Kyle. Move at your regular gait. Come in, smile, be cheerful. Yes. But it's not just that. When I'm fasting, and this is something I'm still growing in this area, I'm fasting because I want to be closer to God. Many times for me, fasting is just beseeching God to be. I want to be closer to him. I want to know him better. I want to, it, 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 quote unquote, sometimes we say, we want to show for ourselves. We want to show God that he's more important. And God already knows in our, our hearts if we're more. It's really for me. It's really for me. Is God most important to me? Is God most important to you? This is not just for the Old Testament. This is not just for what has happened in the past. This is for today. We see even after Jesus went to be with the Father, even after Jesus went to be with the Father, there's fasting. We see that with the disciples. 
we see that happens in a number of situations, but I'm just going to use two. So first we're going to go to Acts 9, verses 3 through 9. Acts 9, verses 3 through 9. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Verse 8, Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. He was blind. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Absolute fast, absolute fast, because he had been convicted. The context was, is that he was Paul, who was Saul at that time, had been persecuting the followers of Jesus, putting them in prison, going all around the area, not just in Jerusalem, but now he was headed off to Damascus to find other ones who were, who had escaped Jerusalem. And now he had actually met the risen Jesus. And he was convicted and contrite. And he afflicted himself. He abased himself before his God. Another one, Acts 13, verses 1 through 3. Acts 13, verses 1 through 3. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Verse 3, then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So you see for us, those of us who are Christians, this spiritual discipline of fasting still continues. But I do want to to make a note of something as I come I close on this. We don't fast anymore from a mandatory perspective. We have been set free from that yearly day of atonement. It is a hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, jubilee, dance all the time. Not just moment, but forever. That God himself came down from heaven and took on the sins of the world. And on that cross, he hammered all, those sins were hammered and they are gone forever. All of the sins, brothers and sisters, if you have given your life to Christ, if you have given your life to Christ, sincerely, your heart has been changed. There's no more day of atonement for you. The atonement is done. Jesus has done it. For your past sins, your current sins, your future sins, for all of our sins, those who know Christ. And just so you know this is true from the Bible, we're going to finish with Romans 5, 
Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 17. Romans 5, verse 12 through 17. Romans 5, verse 12 through 17. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all, <clears throat> all sinned. Excuse me. Verse 13. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was even given. Was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. This is saying from Adam to Moses, that's before there was a law. Because the law came to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. 16, and the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift, free gift, following many trespasses, brought justification. 17, for if, because of one man's trespass, death reign through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the, th the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Folks, we live for God. We live for his glory. So Jesus, when we give, when we pray, when we fast, it's all for the glory of God. It is for the one. It is for him. That's our heart posture. That's where we need to be. And ask the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to help you in this area. If you have a challenge, some of you are just, God has blessed you with a humility where this is not an issue. But for those like myself, this is an issue. The Lord has helped me get better, but I need to seek after him. I need to humble myself. I need to abase myself. And there are times I, I need to fast for myself. But we also see that there may be times the Holy Spirit wants to want you to pray for others. And in a way, even pray and fast. There's, there's supernatural power. In prayer and fasting, you see it. You see it demonstrated throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. I pray you hear God's voice on this. I pray that you lower yourself so you can let the Holy Spirit come through. That you let the Holy Spirit take control of your life. You let the Holy Spirit drive. Or with that famous song, Jesus takes the wheel. It's worth it. It truly is. I hope you feel it's worth it too.